A very good evening and a salam sejahtera to everyone. I hope all of you are doing great as always. Welcome to InBiasis Webinar Lecture Series number 9, 2022. I'm Dr. Nisha and I'll be the moderator of today's webinar series. Well, earlier just now, I believe the short video that we played capturing the gist of InBiasis research background had given you sufficient insights on the Institute as a whole. For those of you who are interested to collaborate with us, feel free to browse the InBiasis website and social media for latest updates and information. Today's Honourable Speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Ng Chen Leong, is our very own research fellow from InBiasis. Before we start, allow me to walk you through his brief research CV. Associate Professor Dr. Ng Chen Leong is an expert in protein structure and functional studies. He obtained his first degree in biotechnology and then a master degree in genetic engineering and molecular biology, both from University Putra, Malaysia. He earned his doctoral degree in structural biology from University of York, the UK in 2007. He then worked as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Medical Research Council, Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, the UK. He joined in biosis in 2012 as a research fellow and had prominently established various protein analysis platforms, which includes the recombinant, recombinant protein purification and protein crystallization strategies. Associate Professor Dr. Ng's research interest includes the elucidation of structure and function of conserved hypothetical proteins, secondary metabolite, uh, biosynthetic enzymes, toxins, and epitopes of allergen molecules. At present, his research group is actively involved in protein functional analysis and atomic level protein structure resolution using X-ray crystallography, applied biochemistry, biophysics, molecular biology, and bioinformatics. His research group is also in receipt of numerous university and national level research grants apart from collaborative engagement with industry partners. Associate Professor Dr. Ng is currently the Head of Genome Analysis and Technology Center and Plant Biotechnology Center in Biosis. In 2021, he was elected as the Vice President of the Malaysian Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and has been a guest lecturer at the International Medical University Malaysia since 2018. With that, I welcome Associate Professor Dr. Ng to start his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Leung. Thank you again, Dr. Nisha, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining um, today's uh, webinar here. Um, so I would like to share with you on the structure and functional study of a uh, house plasma allergen and turbinal biosynthesis enzyme. So um, in this uh, one hour, Hopefully, uh, I can share some background of the about the uh, structural biology and some uh, introduction about the uh, crystal structure study in, in analysis. And later, I will uh, share two uh, story that using a structure guided uh, mutagenesis study approach uh, on uh, studying the. Uh, allergen epitopes, and also uh, how we study the uh, enzyme active site of the uh, cisquitopin synthase. Um, so for myself, I was uh, when I was an undergraduate student and a postgraduate student, uh, master student, I was uh, intrigued by the when we doing um, a molecular biology experiment like. Uh, um, digestions of our DNA. I think uh, most of us are experienced of putting the enzymes and with the DNA and we run the gel, then we see the band has been cleaved from the DNA. So I was intrigued by uh, how actually these things happen. And uh, later I learned that uh, one of the way to, to see how actually the action is taking in the test tube is by uh, looking at the structure of our uh, how the enzyme actually acting on the substrate. 
So over here, I, I show the E. coli one, I think most of us are familiar with, and the DNA uh, binding to the DNA complexes. Of course, by having this uh, structure, then we know uh, almost uh, the, the overview of how the uh, enzyme would and bind and react uh, or catalyze the, uh, the subset DNA in this case. And we further learn that uh, knowing the structure of the protein, uh, of course, the question is how the structure uh, of the protein fold as such. And we learned that uh, there's a bonding or interaction between atoms in the molecule. As uh, shown in the slide, we have a very common hydrogen bond, disulfide bond that we are talking about, hydrophobic interactions, uh, ionic bond that uh, as a whole, um, contributing to how the uh, amino acid sequence that we know to be assembled in a unique structure um, with the unique function as well. Um, in this case, uh, for example, how can a, a protein act as an enzyme, as I've shown, how, uh, including uh, for the interaction, if the uh, protein interact with the subset, like the E. coli 1 and the DNA case. So how exactly the residue would, would uh, interact and uh, um, killing the job on catalyzing the substrate. So from there, we, we, we learned that uh, understand the structure will provide um, the understanding of the function of the molecule as well. So here I, I show the uh, different type of chair and of course, uh, if you look at the structure of the chair, we know each part of them playing a different role, uh, a role uh, to be, to be a, a, a functional as a chair, right? Similarly to, to the protein. So there's domain uh, or motif that we know that would have act uh, specifically um, for a certain function uh, with the structure that has been assembled accordingly. So, and, and in order to see the detail of the structure uh, for chair and uh, objects, big objects, you can easily uh, see by our eye, right? How about for the molecule that are small like a protein or the nucleic acids? Um, so there are methods that we can use to obtain the data to visualize the, the molecule. So for, from the method have been shown here, so um, there are um, common methods like X-ray or NMR or quieton microscopy that we knew that we can obtain the data to, to observe the, the small molecule up to the atomic level. And if you look at the PDB, so there are size of the different size of the protein uh, or macromolecule, including the RNA and the DNA. Um, that has been has been determined to the atomic level. What does this mean? It means that um, we are able to uh, distinguish the atoms, for example, the carbon, the hydrogen, or nitro, uh, the nitrogen, not hydrogen, sorry, the nitrogen atom, or carbon atoms, or phosphate atom, at the position, at the position um, that. Uh, between, between atom and atom in the molecule. So with that, we are able to see, for example, how four cysteine actually interacting with a, with a zinc ion, for example. And all these are providing uh, insights on explaining the function of a molecule. Um, in this case, we are talking about a macromolecule. And the techniques that um, has been commonly used to determine a 3D structure for macromolecules, including proteins, are using uh, X-ray crystallography, uh, using um, uh, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer, or cryo-EN. Of course, there are other methods that we can use um, to obtain uh, data that are able uh, for us to visualize 
the molecule up to uh, atomic energy solutions. So this is, uh, if you look at the PDB data, most of the uh, structure that deposited in the database are, are mainly solved by these three methods. Of course, recently or for many years also, um, computational uh, methods has been emerged and to solve the structure. And why, why so? Because uh, experimental uh, structure that, or data that we have to obtain for each of the molecule, it, take, um, it takes times and uh, it's very costly. And also it depends on the nature of the protein. So for the experimental case, uh, structure that or protein that can be uh, determined using experimental case, uh, 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 methods, it need to be generally to be soluble. And we need to obtain a certain uh, amount of the protein. Of course, uh, nowadays, if uh, using a quarry yen, maybe you're using a less sample. But for X-ray crystallography or uh, NMR, generally you need to have a substantial amount of a purified sample. And hence, it, the, the number of the um, structure that have been deposited is, is, is still limited in the database. It's not mistaken, it's about 200,000 uh, um, has been deposited. So computational method has, is playing a very important role here, where if we could predict the structure and we can understand the function from the computation prediction, then it will be great. So as uh, recently, I think we're all aware that uh, there's a, using a machine learning method, which could predict structure to a uh, high accuracy, about 90% accuracy compared to, uh, in comparison to the experimental uh, determined structure. So like a uh, alpha fold two or loss theta fold. Other method like eye tester and uh, um, homology modeling uh, Swiss model uh, and many others also able to predict reasonable good structure for um, structure having a sequence identity, uh, which template is uh, available in the PDB. So um, in, in biosis, uh, we do notice that the structural biology is part of or provide the information that can integrate into understanding the system's biology. Hence, uh, we, we also uh, apply uh, structural biology into uh, certain projects to better understand um, the biological system in a in holistic way. So if recently we have seen this, uh, the 3D whole cells model for the microplasma. And um, I'm showing here is that uh, imagine um, in a cell, uh, it's full of uh, molecules, small molecules as well as macromolecules. And all the molecules are actually dynamics. And in order to really understand how a cell work, we, we may need to know how all the molecules play a role uh, in the cell in particular time, uh, at the particular, particular time. And with that, um, I think we still know very little in terms of uh, understand uh, entire of the system of a cell. And here show the components that build up um, the, the entire problem, entire cell of the microplasma. And um, many of the uh, uh, proteins, um, the structure need to be uh, need to be determined in order to uh, fit into the picture. And of course, um, here showing a, a static uh, um, uh, image of the cells, but as we know that this is not a static. So if, if we put all in, into the picture, so it, 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 a cell actually is a very busy uh, factory and if uh, things are moving and interacting each other. And I think we are, we are still uh, far from, from there. However, uh, understanding every single molecule is, is important and towards the uh, ultimate uh, objective to understand how a uh, cells actually uh, work. So in, in basis, we have uh, determined a field structure 
from bacteria and eukaryotic uh, cells um, for the past few years using a crystal uh, X-ray crystallography. So we, we have uh, um, uh, including the toxins, uh, uh, enzymes that involving uh, in the biosynthesis of terpenoid, uh, human hypotetic proteins, and several of the bacteria proteins. And um, so briefly, uh, we are one, as I mentioned, X-ray crystallography is one of the uh, major methods that has been used uh, for the past uh, more than 50 years to solve uh, macromolecule structures. And um, the facilities that we have uh, uh, to grow the protein crystal, uh, including, for example, uh, in order to grow a protein crystal, we may need to uh, produce uh, pure, high purity of protein or homogeneous protein into a, a certain amount that we can use or, or milligram amount that we can use for, for um, set up the crystallization. So we have an ACTAP crystallography uh, purification system that can use to purify the recombinant protein. Normally we use two-step purification using the affinity and the site exclusion. And the protein then that uh, we obtain then will we, we, we'll be um, proceeding for the um, crystallization as, uh, screening and using the uh, sitting drop on the cell or hanging drop for optimization. And the crystal can then uh, grow in the uh, a chiller. In this case, we use, modify a chiller. So learn from uh, uh, Dr. Ho from uh, UPM, where we modify the chiller with a 19 degree so the crystal can grow up, up here uh, or uh, in, inside there. Um, to see whether we obtaining a crystal, we having the light microscope that to see whether we uh, the protein crystal is growing in the plate that uh, we are we have set up. So I hope this gives uh, some uh, brief idea of uh, if you wonder how uh, we grow the crystal in in basis. So this is example of crystal that we obtain, and after we obtain the crystal, we we will bring the crystal to work together with our curator um, in CCB. Um, Center for Chemical Biology with Dr. Day, or uh, in MGVI uh, with uh, Dr. Anwar as our collaborator, or uh, we send to a uh, diamond light source uh, in Dickot, uh, Oxfordshire, um, with uh, Dr. Yika Waterman. So here uh, we're using the X ray source, uh, either in house in CCP or MGVI, to correct the uh, X ray diffraction data. Uh, while in uh, diamond light source, we're using a synchrotron uh, uh, source to, to obtain the uh, X-ray diffraction data. And after we obtain the data, we will proceed with uh, solving structure using a uh, um, VS program that under the CCP4 uh, package, and which is uh, fully available to everyone. If you are wonder if uh, and willing, uh, would like to try, I think you can you can uh, uh, visit the web page. I think you, you can download it freely. And with that, um, so we will obtain the electron density of uh, molecules. So uh, this is example of uh, one of the molecules that later I will be talking about the allergens. So we observe or we obtain the electron density after we solving the uh, phase problem. And by building it, um, you, we are able to put in a uh, fit in um, each of the residue, I mean, as I mean, as it residue into into the picture, and including uh, some uh, ligand. In in this case, if you having uh, some other ligands, you are also able to see. So I hope uh, that give you a brief picture of uh, how we obtain the, the structure. And with that, uh, after we obtain the three D structure, um, we will further analyze and study. Uh, how how can we learn or what can we learn from the structure and to address a certain particular questions. Uh, in this case, uh, we would like to um, identify the ep epitopes of the allergen of this dust mite. And this work is, uh, is, is, was carried out by uh, Sile. Uh, he was a, she was a, a PhD student in the group, uh, in the lab, uh, in, in basis uh, and collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chiu Fook Kim from uh, NUS Singapore.
So we like to understand uh, what's the correlation between uh, IgE binding residue and uh, specific IgE level. And just a brief uh, introduction, I think uh, most of us know about what's the uh, allergens and uh, the allergen source can come to come from uh, many different uh, sources and uh, with either it's a food or uh, which is uh, I think very common in the milk or seafood or nuts and also uh, alloallergen which from like pollen, uh, fungi and also a dust mite. So we would one of um, the, the, mod, uh, the model that we are talking about today here is from a dust mite and in the database of allergen uh, nomenclature there's 1,500 groups that has been uh, listed and as we know that uh, allergy causing a lot of problem and uh, about 3 million of, billion of people are having this uh, allergy problem. And the cause of the allergy uh, is, is, is because of the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction mediated by uh, IgE antibody. Um, the, so what was happened is that uh, when when uh, a person sensitized to the aller allergen, which is uh, when he's first exposed to the allergens, so the dendritic cell will display the allergens into the naive T cell, where the naive T cell will, will then differentiate into the T helper 2 cell, which then will uh, secrete out the, or produce the interleukin 4 or 13, which cause switch class of the uh, knife B cell um, to a uh, manual B cell that produce IgE. So the IgE is actually bind uh, tightly to um, uh, uh, FC epsilon the receptor of the, for example, the mast cell or the best of cell. So once um, the allergen came in and cross linked with the IgE on, on the mast cell or the best of cell, then it, it will cause the degranulation, which is release of a uh, uh, various of the molecules that can uh, causing or result in uh, um, contraction of the smooth muscle or vasodilation uh, or increased uh, vascular permeability and uh, bladder uh, aggregation and degeneration, which is result in the symptoms that we are having of the uh, allergy. So, and uh, dust mite, house dust mite is one of the uh, major source of, of the allergen that causing the allergy and uh, from about 50, 50, uh, 45 to 85 percent of the asthmatic in, in uh, Europe, uh, uh, America, Africa and Asia is causing by uh, related to this house dust mite. So the, uh, the name of the uh, allergen later you will see is a uh, uh, depend, uh, for, uh, derived from the name of the the bugs and with a group followed by the groups. So the house does mind having uh, many sources that can be uh, allergens. And um, so from the protein that of uh, of the dust mite, then it can further categorize or uh, has been uh, categorized with the denied group of the allergen from the house dust mite. And what we are looking at today is uh, from uh, group 21 as an example uh, of this study. So group 21 allergen is a mid-tier allergen uh, with unknown fun biological function uh, until today. And it's found in uh, uh, the digestive system of the, of the bug. So the research question that we're asking is, uh, where are the possible IgE binding residue uh, of the the F then then you want allergen of the allergen, and we also would like to ask: uh, Are there a correlation between the IgE binding residue and the uh, uh, IgE level of the uh, of the of the person? So to address uh, where are the possible possible uh, IgE binding residue or uh, bit of side of the allergen, we, we may need a structure, a high student structure, so that we know exactly where the uh, residue is. Because if we look at just um, um, 
uh, amino acid sequence, we are we are unable to to know which residue is involving or has a potential as epitopsin. So we solved the crystal structure from as just now you have seen the uh, electron density uh, for this structure into uh, one point five Amstrom uh, Amstrom like solution. So uh, what we want to learn here is uh, the, what what are uh, surface exposed polar amino acid residue of this molecule, and uh, why so? Because uh, surface exposed polar amino acid residue are we, we know that are most abundant uh, IgE epitopes of most of the protein allergen. And with that, we are able to identify uh, 38 solvent accessible polar and char charged residue. And we further create a mutant, a single um, uh, residue uh, mutant, for example, uh, uh, aspartic acid um, mutated to alanine. So we, we make 38 mutant that all um, mutated to alanine and produce all these uh, uh, mutant protein, recombinant protein. Using these uh, decombinant proteins of a single uh, residue uh, mutated, and we try to address the following questions. So the correlation between the IgE binding residue and um, specific uh, IgE level, uh, are there a correlation between them? So we use the immunotopular assay uh, using the atopic sera, or, or the people uh, serums who are atopic and uh, using the wild type and the mutant protein. So with that, uh, we, uh, with, with the collaboration uh, with, uh, with our collaborator, um, 24 atopic sera is obtained and uh, to be carried out for the immunotoplot assay. So this um, show the uh, workflow of uh, in immunotoplot assay, where uh, either the mutant or the wild type will be used, and the allergen will stem on the uh, nitrocellulose membrane. Um, allergen protein were dotted to be get, so that then uh, we apply into the with the sera incubate with the sera. So the uh, anti human IgE conjugate with alkaline phosphate will be applied, and we will see the chromatic development of of this uh, assay. And from there, uh, we will distinct able to dis distinguish um, the um, specific IgE level in the in the serum. So this work is uh, was done in uh, Prof Chu's uh, work a uh, uh, lab. So the um, IgE level is classified according to the immunocat classification system. And uh, from the 24 atopic residues, so 10 are classified as high, five are very high, and, and the, the class of six is uh, uh, more than uh, 100 IU per ml, very, very high. So with that, uh, we identify a significant epitopes and a major epitope. So, so there's a definition for it. Uh, bear with me here. The so significant epitope means a mutant residue that caused more than 20% of reduction in IgE binding in compared to the wild type. The major epitopes means that a significant epitope that caused reduction in more than half of the total number sera of each IgE classes means that uh, um, so from the significant, significant epitopes, then we further identify the major epitopes. So from the results, uh, six major epitopes are identified and they are located at the N terminus um, and the alpha 1 helix and the L1 loops region uh, of the allergen. That's why um, it's important to know the structure because we know uh, where the epitope residue actually is situated over here. And this is uh, important because we knew that uh, this residue involving with IgE binding. So if we could want or we would like to design a hypoallergen uh, likely that we, we may want to have this uh, 
um, mutated, for example. So the result also show that there's a positive correlation between the number of major epitaph and the uh, sera in the um, the specific IgE level in the sera. So, for example, that uh, the when when the specific IgE level is low, then you see the number of major epitopes is is less. So the the more the higher the um, specific IgE level of the of the serum in the serum, the more major epitopes actually is identified. So it also show a clear random distribution of significant epitope residue for tested uh, cellular classes. Uh, suggests a hetero heterogeneous uh, population of IgE in the cellular of a topic individual in epi epitope necromation. So this is in, in agreement to the study on, on uh, food allergen uh, before. As because uh, we can throw a question is, um, you have allergens, and you're having a uh, um, IgE. So do, do we know that? Uh, so the IgE actually is uh, detecting a particular residue of the allergen, or is actually uh, having a various type of uh, IgE that recognizing different residue in in the allergen. So the results show that actually we are having a um, various type of, uh, uh, or we having a IgE that recognizing and uh, uh, recognize. A various residue of the of the allergens. So and the atopic individual with higher uh, specific IgE level have a more diverse uh, specific IgE. So the if you have a, a high IgE level, um, likely that it also having a recognizing more uh, residue or more atops of the allergens. So the number of met major epitope residue increase in the study population from a low to high uh, IgE level. I think that's a, a quite a clear uh, picture that we see from the analysis. So we also ask uh, next, we have done this uh, f 21 So we further ask is the correlation between the epitope diversity and uh, specific IgE level conserved across different group of uh, aero allergens. So with that, uh, we evaluate uh, another uh, house dust mite allergen, which is DER-P23. So DER-P23 is also a, a small protein with 14 kilodalton. And in this case, uh, we use a structure, crystal structure that has been deposited in the PDB database, um, which was solved at uh, 1.5 uh, Amstrom resolution. And using the crystal structure, um, 17 Soen accessible and polar and charged residue were identified. So uh, we produce a 17 a mutant of the recombinant uh, proteins for the uh, immunotop plot, is a, as we have, I have uh, explained just now. So here just show that uh, all the mutant protein that we produce are uh, into a pure, uh, high purity before applying for the immunotop plot assay. So similar correlation were observed for the number of major epitopes and the uh, cellular or specific IgE level in the serum. And with that, uh, two major epitopes residue were identified for this, uh, the, the P23. So what can we learn from uh, these two uh, uh, findings of the F21 and the P23 is that uh, the collision between the IgE the binding residue and the specific IgE level of here we're using a specific uh, IgE binding residue or epitopes uh, or in other words is epitopes uh, of both allo allergens indicate that profile of major epitope of allergen could vary between atopic atopic individual. It means that if you are both allergic to the same allergen, it doesn't mean uh, we, uh, we may have different uh, profile of uh, uh, major epitope that recognized by the specific uh, IgE. 
And the major epitope residue of allergen can be further classified according to the um, specific IgE level of a topic population. So for, um, if we could have more data, I think uh, for particular allergens, then for people who are having certain uh, specific IgE level, um, we may know um, which residue actually is a major epitope for, for these uh, people. So hence, a more precise and major epitope identification of allergen for uh, a topic and the individual can be achieved by knowing their um, specific IgE level. And the individual who have a higher number of IgE binding residue uh, may face bigger challenge to be treated to immunotherapy. That's what we hypothesize. Well, that, that's what we think, because. Um, if you're having a very high IgE level, means um, you're also mechanizing many uh, residue randomly uh, in the, of the allergens. Hence, uh, if you like to uh, do the immunotherapy or producing a, a hypoallergen, that would be uh, more challenging. So, however, the finding uh, we think that it will contribute to the development of a more precise diagnostic method that could identify a specific uh, um, epitopes of uh, allergen for, for the persons. And it can be used for improvement of personal allergen-specific immunotherapy. So a, the development of a refined molecular diagnostic assay which is maybe using an alanine substitution of a surface exposed residue um, could be used um, for the more precise diagnostic strategy or to develop a more precise diagnostic strategy to add, uh, from, from, from uh, what we have uh, uh, found. Because that uh, if we can use that to test, uh, we have all the mutants of the protein then uh, when we are testing or diagnosing the um, um, allergy or allergens, it, it will be more precise rather than which allergen, but up to the epitope level, right? So it would be another new dimension in energy diagnostic, uh, diagnosis and or for AIT. So I would like to change a, a story from uh, dust mite allergen to um, a cisquindabine synthase of plant. So, um, so this second example of uh, um, mutating or mutagenesis according to the, uh, from the structure that we have obtained and to study the, uh, uh, to address the question that we asked. Uh, in, in this case, uh, I, I moved to study the uh, uh, active site of the enzymes. Um, so beta bean synthase uh, is found in the kasum. Most of us may know very well the kasum. Uh, the, the scientific name is uh, Pichicalia uh, minor. So this work is uh, done by uh, Dixing, who was a master student at the time. So just a brief background. So cisquitabine synthase um, able to generate uh, 200 or more than 200 different cisquitabine uh, uh, skeleton, uh, skeleton molecule, which is served as a precursor for many of the derivative uh, molecule. And the subject is a uh, final cell diphosphate. So many cisquitabine are found to have uh, medicinal value. And uh, for example, at artemisinin the drug for the, to treat the malaria. The mechanism of specific sucristabin biosynthesis will remain unclear. Um, and it is interesting because uh, some of the enzymes producing a single major uh, sucristabin product, while many were found also have producing a multiple different uh, sucristabin products. And when you, when we look at the uh, enzymes active site, they are, they are quite conserved. So the question is, if this active site is quite conserved and uh, how so many different types of the product actually can be produced by, by the enzymes. 
And this is important because if we are able to, to understand how by changing a uh, slight change of the active site and produce a specific uh, product that will be very useful in, uh, in deriving a, a molecule that may have a medicinal value. So it's important for uh, engineering of the enzyme to produce what we actually want. Uh, are, are we able to, to do that? Um, which will rely on our understanding of the active site rank. So this, this structure is uh, derived from a homology model. Uh, we try to solve a crystal structure of this protein, but apparently it's uh, very difficult to, to handle from the very beginning, but uh, later we are managed to obtain the homogeneous uh, with uh, a, a the combinant protein with high purity, but we didn't manage to get a crystal. So we use a uh, homology modeling to obtain the structure of the uh, PMSDS. The, um, so from is a is a medium size of protein with sixty five kilo delta five hundred sixty two amino acid with two um, domain N terminal domain and C catalytic domain. Here show the active site of the of the enzymes where you see the, um, the uh, uh, binding of the magnesium. So this binding or is, is docking from another structure. We're having a, a substrate homo analog bound. So how it works uh, of the enzymes, how it catalyzes or produce a product is that, uh, so it begin with a uh, metal dependent ionization of the diphosphate here. Of the, of the substrate. So to form a financial cation and a diphosphate group. So the, the diphosphate group will then uh, interact with the, and stabilized by the magnesium and also a residue, positive charge residue over here. And this positive charge residue will move away the uh, diphosphate from the active site. And uh, the, pro the protonation of the financial cation may yield the minor product. We think that so this is our result where after we have done the enzyme uh, basically or ca ca uh, carry out the uh, enzyme activity and analyze the product, we found that the enzyme produced 97% of uh, beta sucrephalantine and uh, about 3% of uh, beta phenanthine. So allegedly is this what we hypothesize that uh, uh, the, pro the protonation of the phenanthine cation yield the uh, minor product. While most of the financial cation will undergo the uh, one six cy uh, cyclization over over here, and then uh, move to the uh, to producing the beta sucrephalantine. So this is a major product. So. However, we do know that um, the hydrophobic part of the active site is very important because uh, it's shielding the reactive uh, complication uh, intermediate from the premature quenching and also guiding the carbonation of uh, through the high, uh, highly specific and uh, sophisticated reactions cascade to produce suscriptin. So the product is uh, over here. Is, uh, or, or the hydrophobic region is very important to, to determine what type of product of uh, uh after the uh, catalytic uh, reactions. So just a brief, uh, beta sucrephalantine is uh, antioxidant and also known to have uh, anti-cancer activity. Um, in insect, it's a uh, six uh, pheromone. And in plant, likely having a plant defense, uh, uh, involving in plant defense system, while uh, beta phenanthine is a precursor to the suitable jet fuel substitute phenanthine. So, the what we want to uh, try to uh, investigate or know more about the enzyme is that uh, the one six cyclization. In, in the enzyme or in general in the cyclostepine synthase, uh, uh, in particular in PMSDS is unknown. 
So we like to understand uh, how actually determine uh, where its product goes. We, can we learn more if we are we are uh, studying different uh, modifying the residue in in the active site and see uh, what kind of product actually that we are obtaining. So we knew that now the enzyme could produce two different type of product, even though one is 97% and one is 3%. And learning from the literature, we knew also from other cytobin synthase. So this uh, figure show the uh, superimposition of the structure of the MSDS um, to the Nicodinia tapacum, 5-AP allostol, Losins are synthase, uh, another secretory synthase, which overall structure is very similar. And by learning also from other secretory synthase, we, we kind of recognizing, uh, knowing that the residue in this position, this position may having a role in isomerization or cyclization or L454 maybe in cyclization as well as isomerization. So we then uh, went to um, create a mutant of the residue from, uh, for example, leucine 454 to alanine, um, tryptophan to alanine, uh, leucine also to glycine because uh, we would like to test um, the side chain, a smaller side chain and uh, glycine without side chain. Phenylalanine to uh, 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 serving and also the double mutant. So um, what we learn from here is that uh, for these two, if you look at this is science exclusion chromography, by changing a single residue in the active site, it have a huge uh, uh, impact to to the conformation of the of the protein. So for the wild type, you can see this uh, single homogeneous uh, protein over here that we can purify the combinant protein. But if you look at the uh, uh, W2X6 to alanine and also the uh, phenylalanine 390 to serine, mostly you're getting an uh, aggregate uh, while changing the L454A to G, as well as G, we having, we actually improving uh, the homogeneity because if you see the wild type, you still have a bit of aggregate for the wild type. But over here, it's almost uh, all are in uh, homogeneous uh, fractions, as well as uh, a double mutant. And this is interesting because if you see this is uh, aggregate, but by introducing the uh, mutation to uh, glycine in the residue 4-5, leucine 4 5 4, the molecule assemble back to what, uh, uh, like a monomer that we can obtain uh, from the site exclusion. Nonetheless, the double mutant doesn't have activity and the rest having activity, but uh, a reducing activity. In terms of uh, uh, secondary structure composition to the uh, circular digrosum, it's almost similar for those that actually are homogeneous in uh, science exclusion. So we have uh, uh, exclude those that are forming the aggregate. So when we further analyze the product of the enzymes, it's interesting, it's interesting to see um, um, that the L454G and L454A is actually producing a new product that the wild type is actually not producing. Uh, in this case, uh, four hydroxylated cyclostopin molecules are, are created or, or are found after a single residue mutation at the uh, active site. And uh, with that, we propose the mechanism for the conversion of FPP to uh, BMSDS from the wild type and also its mutant. If it's a mutant, then uh, this is a process we, we go through to obtain the new product. So, um, but in terms of we would like to further understand what could this happen, right? Um, so if you focus on the residue L454 of the enzymes, um, the side chain actually is providing a static hindrance 
to preventing actually more uh, the residue that's surrounding to to move right um however if a mutation the side chain l454 to glycine likely there's a big change over here where there's no side chain and when we try to uh, uh investigate around without the four five uh, the side chain of the leucine um residue for example uh y418 here is actually able to to rotate around and move around that actually may may play a role in um in uh causing the or, or generating a new product of what we have not seen before another more, uh, possibility is that uh without this uh, uh um hydrophobic uh side chain then um the the space over here is uh, enlarged and it may uh, allow the water molecule to to go into the uh, active site where it may allow the hydrocylation of uh or to produce a hydrocylated uh, cyclistopin so that could be two possibility of course uh, this need to be further uh, verified uh, with uh, more experiment so and um, from this uh, study um, that what we have can conclude is uh, by analyzing a single residue uh, or mutating the single residue according to to the structure that we have observed um, based on the literature as well of the function um, enzyme can be more uh, promiscuous and producing a real type, realist type of the product and it also and can change the conformation perhaps a conformation we we actually don't have a uh, answer or explanation to how a single residue from leucine to alanine um, in the active site could actually causing the uh, aggregation happen uh, during the purification so the only thing possible is that uh, uh, the active site by itself also influencing uh, providing an impact toward overall structural conformation um, for the uh, residue with uh, aromatic ring where changing to alanine uh, from would give a big impact where aggregation I think that could be understand understandable because the uh, for example the residual tutorfan where it may involve in hydrophobic interaction that important for the structural stability uh, if you modify it to alanine then it will change overall so I think that could be uh, can be uh, reasonable but leucine to alanine which is I uh, we, we think that and and also is exposed uh, to the active site we, we think that it is not that a big change uh, but yet it's still uh, providing this uh, observation that we are we have seen so I uh, I think uh, with that uh, I would like to uh, end my uh, sharing here and would like to acknowledge uh, people who have contributed to uh, both project for the uh, allergens project uh especially thanks to uh, Sile who have conducted a very good work uh, she's a great student and uh the collaborator uh professor uh Chiu Fuk Tim, uh great uh, collaborator in working together for this uh the F21 and the P23 and also many uh collaborators that involving and contributing to the work um as listed over here thanks to the grant uh from uh UKM GUP grant and also a uh, model in sun grant um Sile also supported by Jamala Chancellor thanks to the other institution who supporting with the facilities and the and the finance and for the uh Sushitopin's Sinde's work uh, especially thanks to uh teaching who have conducted a very good work for this uh for this project and also thanks to uh our, uh, all the uh, uh colleagues such as uh, Dr. Raida, my Zoom, uh, Celia also contribute here, Farhan and others, and also uh, uh, Professor uh, Chan Kokan from uh, UM. So, um, thanks uh, to uh, FRGS Clan for this project.
And thanks for your attention. So if you'd like to further know, uh, knowing more detail about the two uh, projects that I'm share, or please go to a publication that we have published in uh, for the, the F21, the P23, and also a publication for uh, Swiss Synthase. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ng, for the very highly informative sharing. Uh, right now, we are open to questions. While waiting for the questions to come in, um, maybe I can start the ball rolling. Um, Dr. Ng, uh, I was very um, fascinated with your hypoallergen and allergen, the epitope. You know? uh, they were really new to, I believe, to most of us here. Um, I was thinking about hypoallergen label on so many products available in supermarket. Uh, since you were saying that these epitopes are uh, very, there are so many epitopes, how these hypoallergen labels are being assigned to these products? What are their targets actually? Like, um, uh, what would be the efficacy in terms of how many uh, hypoallergens are being included in the product? Um, thank you, Dr. Nisha, for the question. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure about the, uh, there are uh, hypoallergen product in the market because oh, okay. uh, I, I think uh, from uh, what we, uh, at the time when we study, um, there aren't many uh, hypoallergen actually available specifically for the treatment. So those uh, product, I, I, sorry, I, I don't have a knowledge about that. I, Um, actually, there are so many uh, baby products, especially, you know, with this hypoallergen label. And um, uh, I'm not sure how effective are these labels. That is why, I, because you were showing that there are so many allergens and how possible for them to include, uh, you know, uh, the hypoallergen for so many targets. Uh, that, that is why I was asking. Yeah, that's why, uh, that's why from our study, so we, we didn't come across to that. And I think from from what we uh, know, there aren't many of the hypoallergen specificity. For example, for immunotherapy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. So uh, about the product, uh, I'm not so sure about that. I'm sorry for that. Mm -hmm. All right, no problem. Okay. Uh, uh, well, everyone, so today's webinar recorded uh, 36 attendees uh, under the WBAX. And we have 18 on FB platform. So in total, we have 54 participants. Okay, uh, while we are waiting for more questions, um, is there any question for me? Um, uh, maybe, Dr. Leung, you can share what are the challenges of uh, protein structure elucidation uh, when you are trying to elucidate from sequence information only. For, yeah, I uh, mean, so from the sequence to the structure, yeah? Ah, uh, yes, correct. Right. So, um, from the sequence-wise, normally when we're having a, a protein, let's say, we are, what we do, we, we try to do a sequence alignment so we can identify the motif uh, because we can see which residue is conserved, for example, Let's say for the active site of the enzyme, normally the active site would be conserved if, if the active site is uh, dedicated for particular uh, reactions, right? Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, you may see in two dimensions that uh, which residue is important. However, in order to see it uh, in detail, how this conserved residue play a role in the functional manner. Uh, hence, uh, the structure, a uh, 3D structure, came in, right? So the, for example, the, the few re residue that conserve in the multiple sequence, multiple sequence alignment, may be uh, uh, distant apart from each other. But when you look at the structure, actually they come close to each other to work for particular reactions. Hence, I think um, uh, in order to uh, elucidate the function then we, we, we need to pay attention uh, of the structure in detail. So of course, they are also uh, structurally conserved, but the active site may not be very conserved. 
then in order to elucidate, illustrate that, we may need to have a certain uh, knowledge of uh, chemistry in terms of uh, interaction between the residues. So uh, those would help in elucidating the, the function of the structure. Yeah. Okay, well, we have one question. This is from Dr. Murni. Uh, she's asking for your perspective on dust mite allergies, uh, allergy treatment and uh, development of vaccines or usage of specific antibodies to inhibit allergic patients' IgE binding to DUP by mapping the IgE epitopes. In terms of uh, for our reading, for, for one of the um, people try to do is to, to, to get a hypoallergen. Hypoallergen means where you have antibody. So the, the understanding is that when kind of vaccine, right? So you have the antibody against this molecule. So when the molecule came in, um, before it's actually an, able to trigger the uh, uh, hypersensitivity, um, then the antibody, antibody is uh, neutralizing the allergens. So to, to reduce the allergy or to prevent the allergy to happen. So, but from our study here, it looked like it's a bit challenging as I mentioned. So um, that is, if you have a very high IgE, uh, specific IgE level, uh, um, means that you, you already develop and you, have, uh, you already sensitize, and you have, you, and there are many epitopes over there, right? So the, in order to create um, the hypoallergen, you may take out all the major epitopes. So the, the question here is that, would it be stable uh, if the allergen by itself, when we creating it, we have modified many of the residue? Would, would the allergen still, uh, for example, soluble? Can it be de delivered? So those are, are, are questions that need to be, or challenges that need to be solved. Uh, so I, I, we don't know yet for that. I don't have answer for that yet. So as I think there's no uh, multiple uh, or hypoallergen that with uh, many residue, which is, uh, for example, uh, mutated. Okay, all right. Uh, so with that, we don't. I don't see any other questions uh, coming in. Uh, I think we can end the session. Uh, before that, I invite all of you to turn on your video so that we can have a very quick photography session.